Hello, everybody, and welcome back to MarTech Masters. Today, I'm here with Katie Burke, Chief People Officer at HubSpot. I am so happy and excited about this episode. Hi, Katie. How are you doing? Thank you for doing this. I am great. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for being a HubSpot partner. I'm delighted to have this discussion with you this afternoon. We're going to have a great time. This is awesome. This is awesome. What, why don't you tell us a little bit more? Again, people, Chief People Officer, I know you went through HubSpot and had a lot of different uh, hats. You wear a lot, a lot of different hats and you learn a lot about a lot of different things. But why don't you tell us a little bit more about what you do at HubSpot and some of, some of the initiatives you uh, implemented there? I'm more than happy to. So uh, as you mentioned, I'm the Chief People Officer at HubSpot, which sounds a little bit like a made up job. I think a lot of people think it's made up. Uh, but essentially what that means or the way that I think about it is that I'm the product manager for our candidate and employee experience on a day to day basis. So I think about our candidates, our employees, our alumni, our customers and our partners all have vested interest in our employee experience. Even when people are leaving, we want them to say great things about HubSpot. We want them to have grown while they were with us. Um, and so I think of myself on a basic level as the product manager for our culture and employee experience. Uh, now to get a little bit more detailed on that, it means that core HR, compensation and benefits, diversity and inclusion, learning and development, uh, employer brand, internal comms, all those types of things roll up to my team and obviously recruiting. Uh, so I'm really lucky to have a wonderful global team of over 100 people who are doing great work and they are my they are my pride and joy that's awesome and and we've seen firsthand what you do with partners uh when you communicate with us and how involved you are it's been amazing over the last years to see how your role has changed hopspot into being so much better so i want to thank you to begin with because it's been it's been awesome this journey well really i mean the thanks is truly all ours and the way that we think about it is uh, from our perspective, we are, of course, selling software, but we're also helping organizations, millions of organizations grow better, including hopefully yours and your end customers. And from my perspective, as the software market gets more crowded, one of our core differentiators and our competitive advantage is our people. We want people, I can't tell you how many people I meet on the street that say, I love your support team. I love my rep. I love my CSM. And to me, that is a really powerful tool in our brand flywheel. So I thank you. I really do. Every time I meet a HubSpot customer or partner, I start by saying thank you. Uh, to me, you all are the reason we get to do what we do every day and you're the reason we get to keep growing our team. So we're, we're really grateful. That's awesome. That's awesome. So let's talk a little bit about remote work. Of course, this is something that everybody has to do now, but you've been working on it uh, intentionally for so long. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you've been implementing you know, remote work for HubSpot even before the COVID crisis started. You've been super outspoken and, and making it happen. Tell us more about that, please. Yes, absolutely. So I will take you back in a bit of a time machine. Yes. Uh, when Brian and Darmesh first started HubSpot, they still, like so many entrepreneurs, don't love silly rules. They like to be able to do their own thing. They don't like being uh, micromanaged. They want a lot of autonomy and flexibility themselves. And so I actually think from the very start, we've always had a flexible work culture. We've always sort of said to people, the results you create as an employee matter more than the hours you work or where you work. Um, and so one of the things we've always allowed people to work flexibly. I think full-time remote work, uh, we, I think I would say three years ago, we sort of woke up and we're like, wait a second, people don't want to commute as far. They want to spend more time with their families. The, the boundaries between work and life are starting to blend a little bit more. And as a company in general, we want to be ahead of our time, not behind. And so we saw it as a trend that we really wanted to adopt. And so before COVID, we were lucky enough to have over 300 remote employees already. Uh, and we have an amazing woman who's our remote program manager who's really helped us grow faster here. I think COVID-19, if there's a silver lining in all of this, which you know feels hard to find some days, it's that I think we found that we are still able to provide exceptional service, support, sales, marketing, uh, HR, you name it, remotely. And if anything, I think we've learned some new things that we can do as a team and perhaps some silver lining. So for example, I think we've heard more from our introverts. Uh, some people because they can get a word ed in edgewise and meetings. Um, I think folks who are remote are delighted that all of us have had the experience of working remotely. And so uh, I think remote work is a trend that's here to stay long after the global pandemic. I think the pandemic, frankly, has accelerated our investment there. Um, but I'm really fortunate that we were working on that well before this happened. That That's great. So, so what are some of the 
challenges that you've seen from implementing all of this again s since the beginning not just for the COVID crisis but some of the challenges that you've seen and some of the opportunities that came from those challenges what you have learned from it yeah so I think the challenges uh, I'll do in pandemic then I'll do out of pandemic so in yeah. pandemic I think uh, working parents obviously have some of the hardest challenges just navigating child care yeah. uh, and navigating full-time jobs I think has been incredibly hard and I would also say that I think folks who are working at home and have been quarantined solo for long periods of time has been really tough uh, so I would say that's been a challenge so we've been hiring children's musicians and uh, we have drag queens who have read to our uh, our kids population we're doing a bunch of cool stuff uh, but that's been hard because your heart really goes out to our parents and to folks who are alone. I would say outside of COVID-19 on the challenges of remote work, um, a few things I think are, are opportunities, I would say. Um, one is manager level of comfort with remote work. So at HubSpot, like many places, we have, we're really fortunate to have a lot of first-time managers. Mm -hmm. And I think there's just a comfort of being able to coach people in person. That's often how people grew up working. Yeah. And so adjusting to giving constructive and tough feedback over Zoom, adjusting to having people, for example, uh, watch or record a gong for a sales call, for example, and listen back to it it's a different coaching motion. And so yeah. really training our managers to build remote teams and to coach remote teams, I would say is an opportunity for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the second thing I would just say is how we tackle uh, isolation more broadly. So I think when you're more of a hybrid model, your remote team members, especially if they're the only remote team member, uh, can sometimes feel left out. And so how do we make sure that our culture, our benefits, our events long-term are really inclusive and celebrate our remote population versus making them an afterthought? Yeah, and and you, I I I was listening to I, I think it was another interview you were talking about how it's important to make sure that uh, when people are in the room, but then you have other people connected remotely, there's that disconnect between someone laughing or someone saying something. So I love how you created that connection. Some people are connecting all remote, even if they were not remote. I heard that that was amazing, great idea. Well, I got to tell you, it's partially out of guilt. I go, I'm not going to lie to you. I have a really loud laugh and I'm not known for being one of the quietest people at HubSpot. And so for me, like getting to know people before meetings, I love doing it. It's one of my favorite times, but I didn't realize how much my, you know, chit chatting about what I had for breakfast that morning or asking questions about how people's days were going was really making it hard. If you dial in and the first thing you hear is that, you know, sounds and you can't figure out who's talking and which person is talking what about what it's a hard way to start a meeting and so we've tried to be more thoughtful inclusive and for me uh working remotely for so long in COVID-19 has been a good reminder to even check my own ego on this stuff that I can do better even within my own team on this stuff that's awesome that's awesome and you already shared a lot of the things that happened with COVID but through this 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 crisis uh of course I can imagine that that going through the transition before helped but still probably bringing a whole team uh, online brings a whole array of new challenges. Tell us a little bit more about what that transition was and, and what did you learn through those, through those challenges? Great question. I think we learned a lot. As you said, there's no playbook for this. So even if you were a fully remote company, working remote in a pandemic is still totally different. Um, and so I think the good thing about COVID, um, or the good thing rather about HubSpot's culture is we're super adaptable. So we were ready to do that, but I will tell you what, exactly what happened. Uh, I was actually traveling to Dublin. So we got early indications with the coronavirus. Our APAC team, not surprisingly, was feeling it heavily first. So we were really early on in doing a wiki post about resources and here's how we're tracking it and that kind of thing. Um, I don't think when we did that, we had any idea that it would become a global pandemic. And so we sort of thought of this as an HR issue mm -hmm. that we are helping our Singapore and our Tokyo teams with. And it wasn't, you know, perhaps foolishly, it wasn't until I was in Dublin. And at that point, it had reached um, EMEA. It hadn't quite gotten to Ireland yet. Um, but it was certainly clear that it was imminent there. And it was starting to become a bigger story in the U.S., only then, I think, did we realize, oh, goodness, this could actually be something. Yes, mind is blown is the best way to describe it. The, the mind blown emoji is exactly how I felt <laughs> that day. So um, I flew back from Dublin. At that point, I still think we thought it was going to be, okay, Japan and Singapore are closed for a little bit. We'll take precautions. We'll limit travel between offices, that kind of thing. It sort of, thought, it sort of felt like we could stay in the middle ground for a bit. 
And by the next Monday after that weekend, it was abundantly clear that it was going to be a radical change, even beyond what was in my wildest dreams. And so um, what we did was we pulled together a task force of uh, security, facilities, legal, uh, core HR, and then IT. And basically we came up with a plan for uh, what the framework was going to look like, for example, and our colleagues in marketing for canceling events that were external mm -hmm. facing, developing a travel plan, developing clarity on how we were going to communicate things. And so basically for the last uh, three and a half months, we've had a daily stand-up call. We've shipped decisions. We have communicated. And so I think a few things that we've learned from all of it. Um, one is you want to involve a large group of people in giving their opinions but to actually make a decision, you want a small group, much smaller group. And so our decision-making group is actually usually about eight people on this stuff. And I think that actually really helps. So for decision-making, consult a lot of people, but decide and ship with a smaller group. Yeah. The other thing is I'm a big fan of have one quarterback. We decided early that I was going to be the person communicating out to the org you know, that comes with some good things and some bad things, but that way people were always hearing from people operations. There was no lack of clarity and communication. And then the third thing we decided was we wanted people to see and hear from us often. So in the middle of a pandemic, your mind can start to play tricks on you, right? So even in the absence of information, you start to assume the worst. Um, I haven't heard from HubSpot's executive leadership. I wonder if they're planning to change course on retaining key staff. Yeah. I wonder if they're still planning to make sure our partners are looked after. I wonder how they're thinking about holding us accountable on our targets. And so we really made a point as a team to be visible on a weekly basis. We did more company meetings than we've ever done, more Ask Me Anything sessions than we've ever done. Uh, I've learned a lot about the mechanics of a global pandemic. I've learned a lot that pretty much in a crisis, everyone thinks that they're an epidemiologist. Uh, and so I think it's been good learning, but I think the key ingredient in any crisis is empathy. Yeah. Our customers, our partners, our employees, our candidates, there wasn't a playbook for any one of them. And so we really had to lean into empathy. And so if I had to look back and say one thing, Everything we did right was as a result of starting with empathy and everything we could have done better, we could have used an infusion of empathy for a group in making a decision even better. That's amazing. And that's such a good point. It, it, listening and understanding and, and, and trying to put yourself into someone else's shoes and understanding what's happening with your teams and your employees and, your, and the company as a whole, but also customers and partners. There's so many layers uh, of relationships. And uh, like you said, everybody assumes the worst everybody's like oh they're gonna get rid of the, this or they're gonna not do this other thing that we were gonna do or events and uh, communication is so crucial I, I feel like we all had to go again we're a 10 people company and we had to go pretty much through the same process every company pretty much had to go through this process uh, but but I believe that listening was key to all those decisions and understanding where everybody is and saying we are here and we want to help and be part of this conversation, right? And I think it brings out our common humanity, right? So we have, uh, as you know, we do customers and part customer and partner panels on a regular basis. And we did a customer li listening session right in the middle of, uh, right in the thick of COVID-19 when it was really spiking in Italy. Mm -hmm. And we had a customer from Italy who was living in Ireland. So she was not with her family. And she started to get emotional and it reminded all of us, first of all, our heart went out to her personally, but also anyone on our team who's customer facing at least once a day is dealing with someone who maybe they're personally impacted by the disease. Maybe someone in their family is, maybe they're just worried about their own job, whatever the stress is, maybe they're isolated, maybe their mental health is struggling, whatever the case may be, everyone is going through something. And so I think it's a good reminder to come back to your common humanity and I think it's good for people like to have a regular business meeting where customer feedback is just on the product and on our services would have felt so tone deaf. And so it was a good reminder for all of us of what our frontline teams were dealing with. And we thought a lot about our employees and candidates not to forget your core audience of your prospects, customers and partners in this too. Be human, right? Like it's so simple, but so much like people miss it so much because they get right into the sale, the product, the whatever it is that they're doing. 
being human and connecting. And I, I feel like it's also been a challenge for people to connect through video, through Zoom, through phone. Like it, it's not the same, but we've all learned that it's possible also because we're doing it with our family and our friends and, you know, people on TV are doing it. So it's a it's, it's like you said, and I, I keep having these conversations with different leaders and, and everybody's saying the same. This this forced us to be in the future, forced us to do something that we knew was going to happen anyways, and, and being able to connect and be human through these methods, right? And I think it's just a good reminder that you have to find different ways to find joy, right? It's a good reminder that joy exists in different pockets, no matter how you live or where you live or what that looks like. And so, you know, I miss seeing people in the office as much as anyone, especially as an extrovert. Mm -hmm. um, but I will tell you that, for example, today we had one of our employees do a takeover on HubSpot Life, our Instagram account, and she profiled life at home with her two boys and she and her wife and their experience of being two working parents in Ireland with two kids. There are toys absolutely everywhere. And I just have to tell you, I was like, I feel like I'm visiting their house in the best way possible. And I wouldn't have gotten to do that even if I were in Dublin. And so I'm trying to look at the uh, pockets of joy that may not exist otherwise and the chance to be able to see someone's child or parent or loved one or whoever the case may be. And maybe I wouldn't have gotten a chance to meet them otherwise. That's amazing. And, 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 and at this moment when you were talking about that, I know your job is probably the, one of the hardest jobs to have at HubSpot, but but I'm envious of of those pockets of joy in how you connect with people. So it's kind of like a a a, a, a double-edged sword. It, it's weird situation where you probably have the hardest job in the world to make everybody happy, but also you get the rewards of connecting with people at an emotional level that not a lot of people have at, at organizations, right? It's, it's both. And what I will tell you, honestly, is that I have the best job in the world and I don't take it for granted for one day. But I will also tell you, you have to take in the job, realize that you can't make everyone happy. So of I am course. a person who I'm a fixer. I like to fix people's problems. And so my first year in the job, I almost burnt myself out completely by trying to make everyone happy. Mm -hmm. And now I go in, especially with COVID-19, I go in going, hey, making almost 4,000 people happy is just not an option that's on the table. Mm -hmm. Here's how we're going to think about it. Here's how we're going to tackle it. And I don't take uh, negative or constructive feedback so personally because I know that I can't make everyone happy with of our course. decisions. Of course, that makes sense. So let's talk about diversity. Diversity has been... Again, it's not a new thing for you guys. You have been intentionally doing this. As at Next Knee, diversity starts with me. I'm an immigrant. Uh, I'm English as a second language, as you sometimes can see when I'm talking. Uh, the words don't come up, and I'm like mumbling. They sound, and... they sound beautiful. It sounds way better than my Boston accent, I can tell you Thank that Thank you. I agree. That I, I, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Every time someone says that I speak English, uh, I really appreciate it because I, I didn't when I was born. Uh, of course, as a, as a company, as an agency, we have made uh, a, an intentional um, thing to have women feel safe. And, and we, we're like 60% women. Like that, that's amazing. It makes me feel so happy. And everybody, you know, makes the same amount of money for their job. Like all of those things, of course, as a small agency, sometimes it's easier to do, but we still have a lot to learn, even though we have immigrants and we have, you know, women's and, and all, all other kinds of diversity in the company. I also think that there's always room to grow and room to learn. Um, tell us more about your initiative, because if, if I'm like, if I'm struggling with this matter as a 10 people company, I can't even imagine what it is to be doing it on, on a 4,000 people company or, or more. Uh, and how you did it intentionally. Tell us more about that because I believe that's amazing that you've been working for so long on this, on this one matter that's so important. Well, thank you for sharing your perspective. And obviously we're super grateful to have so many folks who are first generation immigrants, who are Latinx. Uh, we're really fortunate to have those folks among our customer and partner base. And so from my perspective, one of the key things that needs to change is moving diversity from a talent initiative to truly a business initiative. Mm -hmm. And so every touch point in which people interact with our brand and with our business uh, feels like it reflects the diversity of our customer base, the diversity of the company we want to build. Now, what I will tell you is depending on the day, there are days when you say you've been at this for a while and I think, yeah, we've made so much progress and we're doing it. 
And then there are days where I look back and just go, my goodness, we've been working at this for so long and we have not made the progress we want. And I think that's the biggest challenge. You know, if you join a fast growing agency or if you grow, you join a tech company, it's usually because you're a go-getter. You want to fix things. You want to check things off your list. Mm -hmm. And diversity doesn't work that way. There have been years when we've made huge progress on gender and not made as much progress on race. Mm -hmm. There have been years when we've made huge progress on LGBTQ and parent inclusion, but haven't done enough on age, for example. Mm -hmm. And so I think the way you have to think about it as a leader is it's a commitment you make for life. And you have to have a growth mindset about it at all times and make sure that you're really rethinking your own approach. Um, and so... A few things I would encourage people to think about. One, as a company, it's really easy to try and do everything. Again, going back to trying to make everyone happy. <laughs> Our most successful initiatives have been when we picked a specific goal or things to work on, thing to work on and really rallied the company around that clarity and we did fewer things better. Uh, the second thing I will say is you really have to make sure that you're pushing some of that responsibility, education, and empowerment down to managers because they make so many decisions about who they hire, how included someone mm -hmm. feels, that kind of thing. Uh, and then the third thing I always think about is you have to assume you can always do better. So going along with the growth mindset. Um, so a good example is Black Lives Matter had such a profound impact on so many companies and so many leaders and so many businesses. I've been doing this work for a while now and I had to rethink, okay, where are my blind spots? Where could I have pushed harder? What could I have done better? Um, and I think the key to all of this work is really humility and always being willing to go back to the beginning, go back to the start, to admit when you're wrong mm -hmm. and to do the work yourself. Um, but oftentimes my biggest advice to people who are thinking about doing this at their own company is people wait for it to be perfect. They wait for, so for example, a lot of people will tell me, we're thinking of starting women's initiative, but we only have five women. And I'm like, well, you're going to have four women soon if you don't do any programming for them. <laughs> uh, and so even if you have a small number of female employees or underrepresented minority employees, you can bring in external speakers, you can build the mentorship program, you can do small things that make a big impact to show people that you care. And so if you're gonna do, just do something, don't wait for perfection, uh, make some progress in the meantime. And then the second thing I would just say is as you develop your plan, because diversity is personal for so many people, mm -hmm. It can be really hard to say, actually, we're not focusing on women right now. We're really going to focus on LGBTQ, LGBTQ folks or whatever or... the case may be. And I think you just have to get comfortable saying, we're going to prioritize this to not get to other things. And that's a hard conversation, but it's really important to make sure that you get the focus and progress you need. That's interesting. And, and I love that you said that, that progress is progress no matter what. It doesn't have to be perfect. Progress is always great. So even if you can make the hire because it's not part of what you're doing, if you run a show like this one, bring women, bring LGBTQ people, bring immigrants and, uh, or, or sons and daughters of immigrants. And that is going to help because you're bringing those people into your group of people, either through a show, through a blog, through content, through an event, whatever it is that you're doing. It's not just about hiring people. And of course, that is very important because that will build your organization with diversity, but also all the other initiatives that you have include people of these minorities and make sure that that's intentional, right? That's exactly right. And one of the things I love, uh, one of our VPs of product, Angela DeFranco, she's a longtime HubSpotter. And one of the expressions she had at some point was she's like, I look for people who name drop interesting people who aren't Steve Jobs or Sergey Brin, right? So who are you referencing? When you say, I want to be a leader, like when you say, I read a book by, mm. is it all the same people? Are they all white leaders? And so I think one thing I also hear from people is, well, I'm not the CEO of an agency or I'm not the CPO of a big company. And what I always encourage people to do is like take Angela's advice, name drop leaders who don't look Ooh, like wow. you. And if all of us did that, the world would be a whole lot better place. And so I think focusing on what you can control versus what you can't makes a big difference. That's amazing. That's a great, great advice. Thank you for sharing that. So uh, again, you've been working on this for a long time. What are, what are some of the positive things that you have seen? I want people to understand that diversity brings so much in so many levels. So you've been working on it for so long with so many people. What are some of the, the positive impacts that you've seen from all of this? Yeah, so uh, positive things. We are one of just 20% of companies globally that have three women on our board. 
We've made double digit improvements in our female director and VP population. So truly when you walk into HubSpot, you feel that the management team looks pretty different from the management team a few years ago and from other tech companies, which is great. Um, I would also say we've made some really strong progress in the programming that we provide that creates access in tech. So for example, one of the programs I love most is our first gens in tech program. And the first gens in tech program is literally designed to make sure that first generation college students, first generation folks who have never worked in corporate America, uh, we really want them to consider roles in tech. And I'm not sure about you growing up, but I didn't grow up thinking like, oh, I wanna work in tech sales or I wanna work at marketing at HubSpot. Uh, and so one of the things we really try and do with programming like that is make sure that people know what those roles are, know how they can be uniquely qualified and provide a lot of panels, upskilling, uh, context, resume reviews, tips, all that kind of good stuff for folks. And so programs like that to me really make a meaningful, meaningful difference. That's awesome. um, and then I would say on the areas where we can continue to improve, uh, I think we have some room. To, so one of the other things I should say we're proud of is our returners program. So returners is basically for folks who have taken a career break, either to take care of kids, to take care of a parent, uh, to explore a different career, maybe you just took some time away. And that program started out of our Dublin office. And so that's a program that I'm really proud of too. Um, I would say as far as areas of opportunity, we like so many other companies in tech still need to improve our underrepresented minority diversity, particularly at the manager and up level. Mm -hmm. And so that's been a big focus of mine over the past few months and will continue to be a big focus uh, and then I think the other thing that I'm really excited about, and I hope you're excited about too, is with Yamini Rangan, the arrival of our first ever chief customer officer, she and I have some big things planned to make sure that DI&B is a big part of the HubSpot flywheel and how we mm -hmm. talk about it and what that looks like. Uh, so you can expect some, some good things from us on the more customer and partner facing side thing. That's great. That's great. That's great. So how can a small, medium, large company, anybody, can, how can you start this? And I, 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 you mentioned some of the things, you know, not just thinking about hiring. If you're not a leadership, you don't make decisions, talk to other people, you know, uh, 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 name draw people that are, you know, diverse. So I, I love those. Uh, those are great piece of advice. What are some other things that small, medium, large companies, anybody can start doing today to include diversity as, a, as an intentional thing in their company? Sure. Uh, so first things first, as you think about who you hire, uh, super important to be thoughtful. So the first thing you can do is just think about slate interviewing. So the easiest way to think about slate interviewing is to make sure that you interview at least three to five candidates and that of those candidates, they all look different from the current composition of your existing team. That's mm -hmm. the easiest way to think about it. And so at a bare minimum, you are forcing people on your team to make sure that they meet with people with different perspectives. So I, you know, I think anyone who's hired people has met someone and gone, huh, wow, not the background I was thinking of, but you would be better at this role. And this mm -hmm. is amazing. Uh, and so committing to slate interviewing for every role that you post makes a really big difference. Mm -hmm. um, second is letting employees guide the way on content. So our first events for all of our employee resource groups were just organized by our employees. They said, here's a speaker we'd like to hear from. Would you pay for food, order pizza, do whatever? We said yes. Uh, so let employees lead the way. And then the third thing would be to involve and engage your managers in the conversation conversation and give them some training and thoughts for how to build inclusive teams. We waited a little too long on engaging our managers and I wish we had done a little bit more of that. That's great. I, I, I heard that you bring speakers that are specifically diverse to just talk to your employees too. I thought that was a great idea. We do. And that really did start with just us saying to our employees, who would you like to hear from? Nice. Um, and so one of the other things is people think about diversity as something you add on to what you do. Think of the traditions in your company. How do you just make them more diverse? So for example, mm -hmm. uh, Hub Talks are the program you referenced. We've been doing them for years. We just weren't always as thoughtful around who was speaking and who was getting the microphone and that kind of thing. And so over the past two years, we've been much more thoughtful around the composition of those groups and what that looks like. And it's made a huge difference in what we've learned and the takeaways that we get from those conversations. That's awesome. That's awesome. Again, thank you, Katie. This has been incredible. I really appreciate you opening up about all these things. Anything else you want to share with us? This is your moment. You can talk about anything. Uh, no, my, my only advice, the question that I get the most from people, the like mm -hmm. single biggest question that I get most from people is, 
where do you start on defining your culture if you don't have one? So if, mm -hmm. for example, you're a small agency, we want to build a culture code, where do we start? Um, and I would give people two pieces of advice on that. Uh, one is to write it down, but two is not to wait for everyone to agree and for consensus on it. So what I always see from most culture codes, people will say, can I send you a draft? And the draft usually says, we want nice people who work really hard <laughs> and like to have fun. And I always think like, what company has ever said, we don't like nice people, we don't want people to work hard. And so one of the things I always say to people is our culture code is as important. There are people who read our culture code uh, and read about our commitment to autonomy and say, I actually want to be told what to do. I want more clarity. I don't want more autonomy. And they go, you know what? Good for you, not for me. That's actually really intentional. That's the goal. And so rather than focusing on trying to get every single person in the world to come work at your company, make sure you're, that you're thinking about people who truly add to your culture versus fit it. And then that just was my last point, which is on diversity, one of the biggest things you can do at any company is to right off the bat, eliminate the word culture fit and instead add culture add because it makes sure that right off the bat, you're thinking about making your team look different than you do. Instead of closing it, you're opening it for people to feel like they can add something to the company and not just if I don't look or act or be like them, I am not part of their company, right? That's exactly right. It feels very exclusive. It feels very clicky. And so if you think about it and you're trying to break into tech and you've never worked in corporate America before, you've never worked in tech, it's very daunting. And oftentimes people won't even apply or they'll leave the company because they didn't feel like they were included. And so instead, if you think about, I always think about it as like, you know, your parents' old recipe. Like if you think about your mom's chili recipe, you want to make it better over time. And so the mm -hmm. people that you're adding to your team make it spicier, interesting, different. You improve upon it over time. You don't say, no, this is the way it's always been and we've always cooked it the same way. And so I think the same needs to be true of your culture. And so training your team early to talk about it that way versus trying to find people who just listen to the same music you do or like to travel to the same places makes your team more interesting and immediately more dynamic right off the bat. That's awesome. And, and, and being outspoken too, there's, there's a place to, to businesses keeping you know, certain things because you don't want to make people sad or angry about what you're saying but who wants again i don't want a customer that hates a certain group of people or that doesn't think that women are the same as men and like at the same time it's sometimes business owners you know and and me myself i I've, with jackie jackie and i my wife amazing wife and partner we run the business together and and we make decisions sometimes that it's like we've made them in the past saying, well, we don't want this person or that person. At the end of the day, we actually don't want those people to be part of our organization and continue to, you know, share either hate or this or that. And I understand that in the beginning, companies can't choose who they have as customers or, or employees or other things. But over the years, we, we started opening up and talking more. And that's why you're here today talking about diversity, because I want people that don't think diversity is important to not be my customers and not be my employees. So uh, I feel like being a little bit more outspoken and open to these things and, you know, how you support Pride Month and, you know, Black Lives Matters and things like that. Those things are important. And it's so great to see a, a, a big company like you guys uh, going through these motions and, and sharing on social media what you're doing for Pride Month or or if you're being part of these things because it inspires us to do better too. So I want to thank you for that too. Well, honestly, that's part of what keeps us going. So on the days when we feel like we're not making enough progress and where we feel like we can do more, part of what we think about is if we are outspoken on this, even before we're even close to perfect, that our ecosystem, which we're so lucky to support so many people in growing their businesses, that we can be in some ways an example for people to prioritize that in their own organizations and to know that we really do care about the people behind your organization too. Definitely. Thank you, Katie. This has been awesome. Anything else you want to share? No, thank you. This is so fun to be here. Your background is A+. plus. You have one of the best Zoom backgrounds I've seen. The typewriters are fantastic. Hold on. They're real. I love it. <laughs> I absolutely love that. My, I've always wanted, if I ever owned a restaurant, so if I had a side hustle, I would own a stationary store. That would be go. my my desired job. Yeah. And so I always think about if I had a stationary company that I would have typewriters on the way out so people could leave a nice note.
They're the best thing in the world. We can talk about typewriters for hours later. Don't worry about it. Thank you, Katie, for coming. Thank you for sharing all this stuff. And thank you again for such an amazing partnership with HubSpot and for everything you do for, for HubSpot and for the whole ecosystem, bringing these issues uh, you know, to the surface so we can all learn and grow better together. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Have a good one. Stay safe. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye.